Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back for another interview show. And our guest for today is Stephen Cable, who is a writer and political activist up in Brisbane. He's written for The Spectator Australia, as well as for our friends at Liberty Works. He also has a personal blog called Cable Critique. Dot com. He describes himself as a libertarian, a neo-Jeffersonian Democrat and a firm believer in national sovereignty. Uh, he's a member of the recently formed and uh, fastly growing Australian Conservatives. So I thought I'd invite him on to discuss his views, Australian politics in general, and of course, the Australian Conservatives. So Stephen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. Pleasure to be with you. Now, I gave a summary of your political views, but what caught my eye is a neo-Jeffersonian Democrat. Can you uh, explain uh, what exactly that is? Yeah, I can. Uh, when Thomas Jefferson and his uh, companions uh, had the American Revolution and uh, overthrew British rule, it was probably one of the fastest, largest leaps towards human freedom that the world's ever seen. Quite literally, within a matter of a few years, they put into place something that had been brewing for quite a few years beforehand, but in a very swift period of time, they actually put in place um, a libertarian form of government, which is one of the first times anything like that had been seen on earth. And Jeffersonian democracy was small government, get the government out of your life, and get the government doing the barest minimum it's supposed to be doing. Um, back in uh, Jefferson's day, the world was agrarian. It was a rural economy. A majority of people lived in rural areas. Uh, now we have a mostly urban world, so it's quite a different looking place. Uh, but the principles they espouse are still the best for human freedom and liberty. Uh, but you know, in this uh, political climate that we're in, I mean, Jefferson was a slave owner. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Um, because there isn't one uh, influential historical political figure that didn't have a fault in their life. Uh, back in Jefferson's day, it was largely accepted, although there were a lot of people stirring to overthrow it. Um, and yeah, you can't throw out one of the most successful political philosophies uh, in world history because one of its founders had a personal failing. The, um, you, know, you won't find a political leader that didn't have to go. And the founding fathers, they weren't, you know, enthusiastic about, you know, slavery like some other uh, American historical figures. That was just the, the way it f was at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm really glad that that subject's come up because obviously it's really hot now at the moment, sort of flared up again. Uh, I listened to a commentary very recently by Thomas Stoll on the uh, subject and up until that time um, most civilizations on earth had had slavery and it had never seriously been morally challenged and the American civilization and the British civilization were the first serious world powers that actually morally challenged and overthrew slavery at great personal cost eventually uh, but it was done and there was serious debate about doing it uh, before that it had never been sort of cast off permanently from the civilization. Uh, I'm glad you took my uh, facetiousness in good spirit there. <laughs> but yeah, like you said, it is a hot topic at the moment, so we couldn't uh, obviously not talk about it, though I am glad that uh, even the or American liberals there, because Trump has said, who's next, Jefferson and Washington, and the, the liberals have said, oh, no, we, we wouldn't do that. So there is still some sanity in the world. Yeah, except today I read that they had, um, ESPN had stopped one of their um, commentators on a football match from commentating because his name was Robert Lee. If you can believe the insanity that's going on over there at the moment. Yes, uh, uh, people are, are triggered just by, by hearing the name. But um, yeah, let's, um, really good. Let, let's talk about your political background. Um, so uh, obviously I mentioned that you're currently a member of Australian Conservatives, but what's, uh, have you been politically active throughout your life? 
No, not really. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, I was living in Darwin and I joined the PLP, Country Liberal Party, for a short period of time. I kind of really wanted to see how grassroots politics work. So I was kind of a little bit involved there, but not to a great extent, and then didn't do anything for many, many years. And after moving down here to Brisbane, I, uh, I had a look at One Nation at the end of last year and uh, joined up briefly there to sort of get involved and basically discovered that there was kind of really no room for getting involved in sort of campaigning strategy or policy development or anything like that, which is just the way they run things, which is fine. Uh, and then uh, when Australian Conservatives came along, I said, this is it. I think this is the best chance our country is going to have of a serious political party on the Conservative side of things and decided to just really get involved. Uh, what was sort of like, because uh, uh, obviously you, uh, from what you've said, you haven't had a long uh, association with being politically active. What was sort of, what clicked for you? What sort of made you feel that, yes, I've got to get involved now? Yeah, a very good question, Tim. Um, I've always had an interest in politics. I've always watched it very carefully, always follow the news. Um, and although I do enjoy my job, uh, you know, it wasn't the real love of my life. And I thought to myself one day, what is it I really love? What do I keep thinking about all the time? And I dawned on me, this really is politics. Uh, so I thought, why not get involved? And... Um, Plus, I'm at a stage in life now, my kids have pretty much grown up. I've only got one at home now. And so I've got a lot more free time to get involved and start doing something. Yeah, you've definitely been uh, very active of late. And, of course, one of the organisations you're involved in uh, is Liberty Works, which is, um, for those who are not familiar with it, a libertarian activist group uh, based in Brisbane. We had the founder and president of uh, Liberty Works on uh, this podcast uh, last year, Andrew Cooper. Um, but um, it's obviously been... Uh, gr uh, growing significantly. One of the things I noticed that we, as you have your deplorables lunch now, that's that's quite amusing. So can you give us an update on the, the activity of the organisation? Yeah, so the latest thing we've got going at the moment that you just mentioned is the deplorables lunch. We're having one every month. Uh, I didn't get to the first one, but uh, I did watch the video of it. Uh, the next one we've got, we have Gary Johns, who's going to be there on the 5th of uh, September. He's going to be talking about his latest book called, uh, I believe it's called Your Body Belongs to the Nation, about the nanny state. Uh, now, that's held at the Connor Court Book Room in West End. So we're right, for those who don't know, uh, the rest of the country, West End is kind of like a very sort of left-leaning kind of uh, urban centre of Brisbane. So uh, it's set up right there in the middle of it, which is a fantastic location. Uh, the biggest event that Liberty Works has coming up is on the 14th of October. We have Liberty Fest. Uh, where we have quite a number of speakers coming. In fact, uh, let me just grab that list of speakers for you and I'll uh, point it out to people. So we have um, Dan Mitchell from the Cato Institute in the US coming over. Uh, we have Mark Layton, Ross Cameron, Tony Morris, QC with Callum Thwaites who were involved in the uh, famous and infamous 18C case. Uh, Anthony Dillon, Jacinta Price, David Lionhelm, uh, Malcolm Roberts, Daisy Cousins and Jim Allen will all be speaking, uh, plus some additional ones. Um, on the 5th of October, there is a launch of Ian Plymer's uh, book with Ross Cameron in Sydney. And we also have an event with Joe Nova in Perth. And I'm not sure the date on that, but that will be put up on our website. So uh, we'll be having an event with her over there. And in the past, we've had other events. We have Politics in the Pub, where we've had... Uh, Malcolm Roberts, Andrew Lamming and David Lionhelm all sort of coming to give um, uh, talks while everyone can have a drink and listen. It's a pretty good uh, atmosphere. And, um, yeah, so we're basically just having an influence, getting the other argument out there, the other side of um, the way things can be run. And, uh, yeah, opening people's eyes that um, the government doesn't have to be making every decision for you. In fact, uh, we need a lot less government than we've got at the moment. So Liberty Works is all about engaging uh, people who you know may, may not 
uh, or be a, be a bit hesitant to sort of, you know, get involved in a political party just to learn a bit more about, you know, what the important issues are and, you know, uh, uh, how to, you know, make sure that Australia gets back on track? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, when you grow up in a sort of political, social, economic environment, you tend to believe that's the way things have to be uh, because that's kind of all you've known. Uh, but um, there is a much better way to run society on many areas. And uh, people don't realise the amount of distortion that happens in economics and in their lives by government interference and action. And the more you can reduce that, um, the more of your own money you keep, the more of the control of your own life you keep, um, the better life gets for everybody. And it's yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, Liberty Fest coming in October. The uh, the Unshackled uh, uh, will be a, a sponsor of it, so we'll definitely be there and um, uh, you know, look forward to meeting some more like-minded people up north. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good event. Actually, it's going to be jam packed. And it, it seems that uh, Brisbane, it's it's beginning to have quite the uh, uh, quite a significant liberty scene. I mean, there's not just Liberty Works. There's the Australian Institute for Progress, which do uh, research, and uh, Conocourt Publishing is also based up there as well. So uh, uh, there is quite a, a vibrant mm. uh, scene up there. Yeah, it is. There's, there's a pretty good vibe, uh, if you could call it that. Um, with a lot of discussion going on and uh, yeah, just people really willing to get active and uh, get their message out there. Um, the Australian Institute of Progress, uh, they're a good bunch of guys. They do some really good think tank work. Uh, they put the effort in to produce some good policy. And uh, if you don't have good policy, you have bad policy. Uh, and so it's a lot of work, uh, it's a lot of effort and uh, they should be applauded for it. Their latest publication is 10 Big Ideas for Queensland, and uh, they tick a lot of the boxes for common sense. Now, obviously, I mentioned that uh, you're a member of Australian Conservatives, which was, it was only started this February by uh, former Liberal Senator Cory Bernardi. Now, there's been a lot of media commentary about the party, you know, uh, how well uh, media commentators are predicting it'll go. Um, Cory Bernardi's uh, been yeah. eager to point out that, you know, there's been a huge uh, growth in membership. They're already registered in several Australian states. Are you at liberty to give us a, an inside view at how the party's growing? Yeah. Um... I don't know if I have inside information because basically uh, Corey and other members of the party have been pretty public with the sort of information that most people would want to know. Um, so currently there's about 14,000 members was the last number I heard. There's about 3,000 in Queensland um, and things are just growing. We've, um, we've got a lot of supporters group meetings that have started up. I run one in West End. We meet in the Connor Court book room. Uh, and we have a guest speaker come along and um, give a talk and there's a lot of enthusiasm out there. There really is a lot of hunger in Australia for a really truly conservative political party uh, that isn't going to keep compromising and keep shifting to the left, uh, which makes... Um, you know, every, t every time the uh, Liberal National Party moves to the left, it gives the Labor Party an excuse to move further to the left. It creates a vacuum for them to fill as it keeps shifting more and more. And Australians are getting pretty sick of it. And uh, they've realised that there really is a need for a new political party. Um, Corey did a tour up here uh, last month. The meeting I went to in Brisbane, there was about 450 people turned up. So for a party that's only been going for about six months, that's, um, you know, I think that's pretty good indicator of the level of enthusiasm that's out there. Uh, that's probably one of uh, what I wanted to ascertain, like uh, how the how many branches there are, and from what you've seen, there's uh, there's quite a few active branches, and everyone's really enthusiastic, and like it feels that you know I'm really part of something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're not actually strictly speaking branches; they're more like uh, what we call supporters groups, um, but. You know, what we do in the meetings is we have like a guest speaker, generally speaking, maybe a bit of an expert in the field. The last meeting I held, uh, we had um, Graham Young from the Australian Institute of Progress presenting those 10 big ideas. Uh, so that was very well received. 
it got some really good robust debate going in the meetings. People didn't hold back. It's not like a a uh, uh, backslapping club where everyone agrees with everybody else. You know, there's a bit of debate. Uh, and it was good. It was good. It draws out answers. It makes people think things through. And then we just had an update on what's going on in the party um, and how things are moving along with registration. So in Queensland, we're moving towards registration um, as a party in the state, which, uh, again, is, is public knowledge. Um, and they're doing that in all the other states as well. We're already registered federally, so... In my home state of Victoria, uh, Australian Conservatives got registered in about two months, which was very impressive. Uh, I mean, it ju just like that, in which is, you know, n n nobody thinks that, you know, Victoria is, uh, um, you know, the, the centre of conservatism. So that was certainly an impressive effort. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was one of the first ones off the block. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, from the Queensland perspective, uh, I've gathered the impression that Corey was actually quite taken aback by the level of support he had up here, um, from what I've heard, um, which wasn't a surprise to many of us up here. Queensland is one of the most conservative states yeah, in Australia. Uh, for example, on the issue of the Republic, um, Australia gave the highest no vote uh, on the Republic back in 1999. So it um, gives you a bit of an indication of the feel up here on many issues. Uh, so it wasn't a surprise to us, but I think Corey was taken by surprise uh, by the level of support he had up here. Well, that's probably because uh, most outsiders think that, you know, Pauline's got uh, Queensland locked up for herself. Yeah. Um, one Nation is, uh, you know, having impact. Uh, the last poll showed that their support had dropped since the high uh, of the last election. Um, but, you know, polls are like they go up and down. It's pretty hard necessarily to ascertain exactly how accurate they are. Um, so time will tell how that plays out. But they're certainly being predicted by all the pundits to uh, be a, certainly a, a substantial player uh, in the next state election, uh, maybe even holding the balance of power with the LNP, uh, the way things are looking at the moment. I think the reason that there's a lot of uh, speculation about how well uh, Australian Conservatives will do is because the party hasn't faced a, an election yet. So it's uh, re really still, um, I I'm sure there's a lot of you know, nervous people in the party, you know, hoping that all the, the hard work uh, uh, pays off. Do you, does the party have a you know, clear election strategy? Well, they just recently released all the party's policies, uh, which were, you know, I couldn't, they, were, they tick every box for me. They're a really good set of policies, a good energy policy, a good immigration policy. In fact, in one meeting, I once advocated that we uh, adopt um, the Swiss model of citizenship where you have to be a resident for 10 years before you can get citizenship. And uh, that was one of the policies that came out um, in the party, which I was very happy to see. Um, so they've got some good policies and I think as far as campaigning goes, that's going to be your foundation. You know, you've got to have some policies to take to the electorate. You have to be able to show people that you're capable of governing. You have to make sure that you can go beyond the hot button issues that sort of get conservatives fired up and show that yes, we can address those issues, but we also uh, can be trusted to run uh, the shop without sort of putting everybody out of a job or making some huge big misstep. And I think they've certainly taken steps in that direction. They, uh, no political party will be um, able to avoid the problems that are common to all political parties. You're always going to get some sort of infighting. There's always going to be teasing problems. Uh, there's always going to be debates happening within. Uh, there's probably going to be some missteps. Um, I don't think it's possible to be immune from all of that. So, um, yeah, I think they're off to a good start. Certainly, I'm happy with the way things are looking at the moment in that regard. Oh, well, certainly it's been, uh, uh, I would put it, a flawless start by the party. I mean, getting 14,000 members, getting registered in uh, uh, Victoria, I mean, uh, it's, yeah, and like you said, there hasn't been, you know, any... Um, 
you know, mishaps or, you know, internal infighting, which I'm sure if there was, the, the mainstream media would be the, the first to, to write a story about it. And uh, Corey uh, himself, he's uh, been at pains to say this is, you know, not a, a cult of personality party. That's why I called it the Australian Conservatives, even though on social media it's always called Corey Bernardi's Australian Conservatives. <laughs> yeah, um... <clears throat> I wrote an article recently um, which went on The Spectator and it covered the issue that um, Chris Kenny had alluded to in The Australian, which I thought was a very, very good observation. Um, if you look at some of the more significant of the minor parties that Australia's had in the last 20 years, uh, the Greens, the Democrats and One Nation's um, first time round, um, there seems to be a ceiling it varies from place to place and area to area, but there seems to be a ceiling of 10 to 12 percent primary vote. And getting past that is, is a pretty monumental task. And to do that, you've got to make sure you go beyond having relying on a primary spokesperson to be your cut through to the electorate. You've got to go beyond that and build, uh, do all the hard work of building a team on the ground to really build your party, to have those policies that show people you can be trusted to run the place. And uh, yeah, that's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a, that's going to be a big challenge because every time uh, a new party comes along and the electorate like what they're doing and they like their policies, you see the major parties shift to try and gain those electors back. And Australians do like falling back into their comfortable voting pattern. So it's it's going to take a lot of work. Um, you know, you can't take the electorate for granted. You can't just assume that because uh, they think conservative and you're a conservative party, you're just going to get their vote. Uh, you have to earn it. Yeah. And you definitely feel that Australian Conservatives it has the uh, potential to uh, outlast or rise above other minor parties on the right, such as One Nation and the, the Liberal Democrats for that matter? Yeah, I believe they do. I think the fact that, as you said before, they're not relying on one personality. Uh, as you said, Corey is, um, most certainly doesn't want it to be a party based around his personality or his reputation. Um, he does want to make it an inclusive party. And um, those, to me, are like the best indicators that it's going to go beyond um, a famous person. And, uh, and that's what's necessary. Um, and and it's, attracting, it's attracting people who have the capability to contribute to policy development, uh, to effective campaigning, and, and showing those people that you can come and join the party, you can get involved, and you know some huge embarrassing thing isn't going to pop out of the woodwork and make you think to yourself, oh, gee, why did I ever get involved in that? You know, which I, I'm pretty sure has happened in a few other political parties. Uh, and I think um, to get that happening, there's a time factor. Um, you know, there's lots of people like me who, uh, you know, we, we believe in the things that they stand for. So we're going to join and put our effort into it and make it work as best as we can. There's other people out there that, uh, okay, they, they, they look at it and they say, okay, we like what you stand for. But as soon as we see that um, it's stable and that it's, it's being run well and that you can be trusted to do things properly, then we'll start coming on board. You know, like there's that, there's that time factor where you start winning over more and more people. They get used to the name. They get used to the party. They see that they're not a bunch of loons. And, uh, and then you can start gaining that trust with a greater circle of people in the electorate. I think the problem always has been with One Nation, even though Pauline Hanson's always had uh, uh, quite a you know, large... Uh, groundswell of support is that the the party's never been run a, a proper political party. It's I, I don't I don't want to be too disparaging for it, but uh, but it's just it, it's it's always been run in quite an amateurish fashion, which uh, which uh, as I said, the uh, Pauline like she has you know a large swell of support in the public, but it's just that she's always lacked that party infrastructure, which is necessary to you know sustain and you know grow the party. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly sure that was the case first time around. Uh, I think that things are being done a lot smarter this time. 
um, from what I've seen. Um, and But it is quite tightly controlled uh, from what I've heard. And But I do think they're doing a bit more of that work, sort of um, getting things happening on the ground, um, sort of treading a bit more carefully uh, as well. Um, but again, you, you really, you know, Menzies didn't build the Liberal Party by doing everything himself. You know, it wasn't the Menzies Party. It became what it was because he attracted the right people and was able to uh, sort of expand the party and make it professionally run, have proper policy development uh, and all those sort of things. So, yeah, you know, there, there's different ways of doing things. Um, I think a lot of people in those sort of parties, they know they're going to be the target of the media. Uh, you know you're going to be attacked for everything because the media leans left and they're going to attack you for most of your policies. So if that's going to be the case, the last thing you want to do is give them unnecessary missteps that you could basically avoid if you just sort of thought things through a bit more carefully. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly um, the case uh, with uh, One Nation. I mean, there's you know nearly a media story about them uh, every every week. Um, and the other party I mentioned was uh, Liberal Democrats. I think. The, the biggest weakness for, for them is just there's not many libertarians in Australia. Yeah, um, I, I think, yeah, I think libertarianism and that whole sort of philosophical view, yes, is not very well known in Australia, um, uh, certainly not as much as overseas. Uh, but I think that's growing. I think uh, David Lionhelm has certainly given them a, a much higher profile. Uh, by winning there in New South Wales. They just got someone elected in the upper house in Western Australia. Um, so, yeah, steps are, steps are afoot for them. Um, I think uh, most people would agree with them on a lot of economic things. Uh, I think where they part ways is on some social issues. I remember when Corey Bernardi came up here and he spoke at a Liberty Works event very early uh, this year. He said, that I work with David Lionhelm on most... Uh, economic things, but we would probably part ways on most social things, so or on some social things. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it's a bit of a hard sell uh, because the media is not going to help you get the libertarian message out there. So, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it all yourself, basically. Now, you still call yourself a, a libertarian. So, uh, pa uh, how do you see, uh, like, you're a member of a party that's called Australian Conservatives. So, what is the libertarian case for supporting Australian Conservatives? So, I would cons I would describe myself as a conservative libertarian. If, you, if, if we're looking at labels, um, I believe in small government. I believe in self reliance. I believe in um, the government getting out of your life. Um, and that used to be the things that most conservatives believed anyway. Uh, that's, that used to be what the Liberal Party used to actually stand for in Australia. It's what the Conservative Party in the UK used to stand for. It's what the Republicans in America used to stand for at one time. So libertarian principles were often embodied in conservative political parties. Um, you know, as you're probably aware, libertarian is sort of, it's pretty broad. You know, there's some people go right to one extreme, there's, there's others that go like a dip to toe in it. Um, to me, uh, on the economic side, there'd be mostly agreement. On the social side, we sometimes have differences. To me, a conservative social view, I think, gives people most liberty. Because when you have a, a breakdown in social order, you start getting anarchy and all sorts of negative things. And, um, yeah, it, to me, uh, the, conservative, the conservative view of social life, uh, I think, lends the most towards liberty and it lends the most towards freedom. Well, if you look at Australian Conservatives' policies, which, as you mentioned before, have just been released, it's very, like, it would be very appealing to uh, libertarian. There's, uh, libertarians. There's a lot about you know, smaller government, you know, personal responsibility, uh, civil society. I mean, Corey is compared a lot of the time to Trump, but uh, you know, Trump can hardly be described as a free, free market person. Uh, Corey, you know, he's... He's very, he's very 
committed to you know a free market but obviously as you mentioned it's probably the the social uh issues where he differs from libertarians and probably that's what the media focuses on uh most of the time Corey's social views uh yes they do um and uh i think you know there, there's two aspects so i think what the media does there, there there's some of them are just like a headline so anything controversial they can pick up, you know, they run with it. Uh, there's another side of the media where they are deliberately um, trying to put him in a bad light uh, and any conservative politician in a bad light. And, uh, you know, that's their thing. So uh, you're, you're focused, you know, if you could have 90% of his policies over here, all very expensive, all uh, conservative policies, smaller government, all that. But, you know, we'll just focus on this one over here that we think we can stir up and get people to focus on and cause a lot of trouble about. Um, but nevertheless, those issues are very important. And to me, one of the biggest mistakes that's been made in Australian politics is um, the conservative side, so to speak, of politics, always focusing on economic and security issues where they tend to be viewed very strongly. But they kept giving up on the culture wars. And they kept w letting the left win the culture wars and infiltrate our institutions, continue to run the education system, uh, have all the quangos. And they kept retreating and retreating and retreating. And now we're starting in Australia to see the fruit of that uh, um, en masse. Because if you lose the culture war, you're going to end up using the, losing the economic war. Uh, if, you, if you lose the culture war, you're going to start ending up um, uh, in the mayhem that we're seeing now, where people think, uh, if I don't like your view, it's okay for me to smash you over the head with a bike lock. Uh, you know, you start getting this to people who feel like they're entitled because I'm offended by something, I have the right to shut you down. Uh, and it's just going to keep getting worse if we don't start uh, fighting back as conservatives and start winning on that cultural front, making the argument and convincing people uh, that, listen, this is a better way to live. This is a better way to run society, uh, not to be reliant on government, uh, not to think that you have to have everything your own way, uh, not to think that you have to continue sliding in this direction. Uh, and it's up to us, it's up to us to fight back on that uh, and not give up and continue giving in. I think one of the saddest things that happened in Australian politics was when Tony Abbott gave up on 18C and, and didn't get that through when he wanted to repeal that. Uh, I think that was, uh, that was a really big mistake for him. And it was symptomatic of what keeps going wrong on the conservative side of politics. Do you definitely believe that cultural issues are the, the biggest concern in Australia at the moment? I mean, uh, I myself, probably like you, uh, are concerned with both economic and cultural issues. But on the when I'm uh, writing on The Unshackled, I feel that I'm talking a lot more about these cultural issues than on economics. Yeah. And they are both very important. They're very much tied together. Um, I tend to look at things systematically or holistically, uh, and they are, they do, they work hand in hand. And um, a lot of people don't necessarily see that um, interconnect. Uh, I think Hayek in The Road to Serfdom uh, explained it very well when he explained that if you don't have economic freedom, you all the other freedoms go. And you know, a lot of people, although they focus on those hot button cultural issues, they're very important, they don't see how they're connected to the economic side of life. Uh, and economics is very important because if you have economic freedom, you don't, you're not relying on the government. You're free to go where you want, you're free to do what you want, uh, you have time and resource to give to the causes that you believe in or the things that you want to do. Uh, if you don't have any of that, uh, you become more and more dependent on the state and you become a vassal of the state. Uh, and then all other freedoms in life start to get eroded. And I think the other reason why a lot of those cultural issues tend to dominate is because uh, people who engage with them emotionally, uh, they really do get worked up about them. And, uh, and if you're emotionally invested in something, uh, it's going to take on huge dimensions for you. So, um, yeah. you know, pick your topic. Uh, but if there's an emotional dimension, people are going to get right into it. Taxation, you know, I don't see the immediate effect of that on my life, so, you know, I'm not going to worry about it too much. Or, you know, oh, yeah, okay, power prices, um, 
you know, I haven't seen the effect of that right now. Yeah, my bill went up a bit, but I can still go and buy a coffee and all those things. So it, it doesn't weigh as much on their mind. Uh, but if you touch on an issue that per- they feel is personally they believe in, uh, then you'll get them in on it. Yeah, that's certainly true. I mean, mo- most people view economics as quite dry, and it's also it's very hard to uh, sell to the the wider Australian population uh, who've been you know so dependent on government and government services that you know this is not the the right uh, the right way to do things. There's a there's a better way, and that'll actually lead us to be more wealthy. I mean that's that's a, that's a much more difficult sell than uh, they're these sort of as you call them hot button issues. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a, it's a harder sell. And um, when it comes to socialist arguments and those sort of things, um, they're an easy sell. You just simply say, hey, uh, we're the government, and if we just do this and this over here, your life will be perfect. And it's simple to understand, but uh, economic freedom and independence are uh, slightly more complica- complicated arguments. And you know, the average person doesn't tend to want to give uh, much of their mental attention to that. Uh, I remember he listened to this comedian once, um, and he said, I, uh, funny enough, he was completely wrong, but it, he said, I don't think you'll ever have a jihad in Australia because if you try to convince your mate to come along and do something with you, he'd say, oh, I'd really love to help you, but the footy's on. And, uh, you know, I just can't make it. You know, and that, it's like uh, typifying the Australian mindset, you know, if I've got my football, entertainment, the things in life I'm used to, the things in life I enjoy, if they're still there, you know, I, I, I'm going to be happy and I'm not going to start thinking about those other issues. You know? uh, what, what do you, what's your um, strategy? What do you think is going to be effective to, you know, like obviously it's much easier to cut through on the cultural side, but what do you think we need to do to get the, the other half of the message through? On which particular issue? Oh, well, for example... Uh, get, uh, uh, balancing the budget, um, getting uh, welfare expenditure down. I mean, how do, how's the best way to sell that to the Australian people? Um, there's several ways to do that. I think um, one of the best ways to do it is to explain to them, if you took, for example, the issue of education. So um, I wrote a libertarian piece on that. Uh, the last few months, and what the government does for you, unless you unless you're in a private school, but even if you are taking your children to a private school, you're still being taxed for their education. Right, a very large amount of your taxation gets spent on the education budget. So you say to people, the government buys your education for your children, basically. So if you're going to a public school, they do it in totality. They take your money in tax, and then they buy education for your children on your behalf. Can you imagine what it would be like if you could just keep all that tax and instead of the government buying the education for your children on your behalf, you could go and buy the education you wanted for your children. So it wasn't dependent on the state dictating all the ins and outs of all the cultural things they have to learn, but you could pick the education as long as it met the minimum standards and the requirements, but you could buy the education for the children that you wanted. Uh, Take other areas in life. Um, one of the best ways to show people is Government Free Day. Government Free Day is when you work out how much tax you uh, give to the government on a yearly basis and then work that out over the course of the year. How many days of the year do you end up working for the government and how much of the year do you end up working for yourself? Now, currently in most Western liberal democracies, you, you work for the government from somewhere from January to about April or May, depending on how much you earn. So basically, all that, if you took your entire wage for that period of the year, it goes to the government. The rest of it, you get to keep. Now, back in 1904, uh, you know, about 120 years ago, government free day was somewhere in mid-January. That's how much the government has uh, been dipping more into your pocket as time goes on. And it, it's basically to personalise it, show, show people what you could do uh, with your money if you got to keep more of it. Uh, you could spend it on what you wanted and then it's your economic power, it is your dollar that determines what businesses live and what businesses don't. 
which direction the economy takes because it will then become completely responsive to market forces. When the government takes your money and spends it on what it wants, it distorts the market and the government's priorities become the main thing rather than the priorities of the marketplace. It's arguments like that. You have to find ways to explain it to people about what life can be uh, when you get to make the decisions rather than Big Brother. You've, um, as I mentioned, written for, you have your, your own website, uh, you've written for The, the Spectator. Uh, what do you see as the, the biggest issues facing Australia like, right now? So right now, the, the biggest issue that Australia faces is energy costs. Um, we have the most abundant energy resources in Australia, but we pay the highest costs. Um, our economy is de-industrializing because of several reasons, but one of the biggest ones is energy costs. Um, we can't let that happen because if energy keeps rising, manufacturing goes, and then you have a completely different form of an economy. And it affects that issue that I mentioned earlier on is about people's own economic power and self-determination. You have to have a broad middle class uh, that has good paying jobs that can determine how they're going to live and what they're going to spend their money on. And that gives you the tax base you need to have a prosperous economy and a well-functioning government. If we keep going down the road we're on at the moment, we're going to be causing all sorts of havoc. We cannot become a nation of tourism operators and baristas because that's what's going to happen if we keep destroying our energy competitiveness. Other nations must be laughing at us. We export our coal to them so they can have cheap power, uh, but we've got governments here that are trying to stop us using it ourselves. We've got some of the richest deposits of uranium, and yet the governments where it resides won't even use it for the power for their own states. Uh, but they are investing it in crazy schemes from Elon Musk. Uh, it's an absolute disaster of the situation. So that's probably one of the biggest issues because that will affect everything else. It will affect, uh, obviously, your power bill, but it will affect the price of everything in, uh, in our country. So uh, definitely energy is going to be the biggest issue, I think, uh, elections coming up. Um, uh, other issues are, of course, the hot button issues of um, um, immigration. Um, and gradual Islamization, so particularly radical Islam, that's going to be another very big issue. No one's letting up on that. And, um, you know, without just looking like I'm here to plug AC, um, their, part, their policy on immigration is going to be an absolute winner with the electorate because they're sick and tired of seeing people coming into this country um, who simply don't look like they want to assimilate and become part of Australia. Um, if you come to Australia, become an Australian. Simple as that. So those are like two of the biggest ones. Uh, and I think just generally, broadly speaking, it's that, that slowly encroaching march of the left into every area of our life. Um, the latest one we're seeing is with the Safe Schools Program, particularly what's happening in your state there in Victoria, seems to be the vanguard of that sort of thing, um, where now they want to get into preschools and five-year-olds and uh, start telling them about gender fluidity gee, they just want to dig in a sandbox and swing on a swing, you know, and chase each other around the playground. And here we are bringing whole adult concepts into their playtime. Uh, I, I think Australia's are going to start getting, as soon as they're wise up to what's going on, I think they're going to start getting pretty sick of this sort of thing. I definitely think uh, energy policy is something where, uh, you know, the majority of Australians are on our side. Nobody likes going to the, the letterbox and getting a huge electricity bill. And, yeah, it's it's important that we do highlight the fact that we've got all this, you know, energy in, in Australia. We're paying some of the highest power prices in the world. And, you know, for what what difference is that going to make to the, the world's temperature when the United States and China are not, uh, not doing anything under the Paris Agreement? Oh, absolutely. Um, if they're not doing anything, uh, um, even if it would even work and actually have an effect, which is highly doubtable, um, if they're not doing anything, it's not worth us doing anything at all. Or we contribute 1.3% of global uh, man-made carbon emissions. And even he, uh, uh, Dr. Finkel, Professor Finkel, in his uh, testimony to the Senate was asked by Ian MacDonald if we suddenly stopped making, uh, producing any CO2 overnight, would it, 
what effect would it have? And he admitted it would be virtually nothing. So we're going through all this pain for absolutely no gain, even if they were right in what they're saying. Uh, and obviously you mentioned you know, uh, Daniel Andrews and, and Safe Schools. Well, we've got uh, yeah, not just uh, the home of the Safe Schools program, but also the Respectful Relationships program, which is designed to uh, ba basically suppress you know, masculinity, that it's you know, um, uh, inherently bad to, to be a male. And also, there's, I, I've written heaps about what Daniel Andrews is up to. I mean, he gave, he gave an apology to uh, the uh, Chinese Australians during the gold rush in the 1850s for the way they were treated. Uh, he's also got his uh, anti-racism thought police uh, for so uh, it's terrible down here. Yeah, um, tell me, has he ever had a real job? Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not too sure. Uh, uh, and I don't know how he you know, introduces these programs with a with a straight face. I mean, how he actually thinks that this is what you know the people are asking for. You know, I'm really glad you brought that up because. This is a line of thought that, it's, that I've had over the last few weeks with all that's going on, is so many of these concepts that we're talking about here, is you can show how far they are out of the mainstream of Australian thought because nobody else thinks of them. Like, you just get this very small, completely weird clique that seems to somehow get a hold of um, powerful positions in education departments. But it, these ideas never occur to anybody else. Uh, you could just walk down the street and ask 100 people and say, gee, what do you think we need to be doing in primary schools? None of them would say to you, we need to teach them about gender fluidity. These things never occur to anybody else. Uh, and, and that's a very good indicator to you uh, that the people that are coming up with these sort of things, they don't, they don't have the interest of general people in heart, at heart. They're coming up with ideas uh, that you would never think of uh, that Australia doesn't need and aren't going to fix any problems. It's just their weird way of viewing the world. And I think with with highlighting all of these, you know, uh, well, it's not, uh, not just uh, Victorian government, even though it's uh, it's it's picked on the most. But uh, I think it's pretty important to make the point when highlighting all of these programs that this is the end result of increasing government. They're going to use government to, to push their their worldview and uh, conservatives. It's it's not enough to basically for them to get into power and change it to what they want because when the when the left get back in they're just going to change it back to what they want the the solution is you know government reducing the role of government not having these programs period and you know ju just leaving all the, the these sorts of you know social education thing to uh, parents and community groups absolutely yeah absolutely uh, on that issue of teaching children moral um, and ethics that is the duty and the right of parents. The state has absolutely no business getting involved uh, in teaching children a moral view because it's going to be the government's moral view. And so the long-term solution to overcoming those things is, number one, uh, having a public educated to not be willing to put up with the government doing this sort of interference in their life. Um, the only thing a government in intent on doing that sort of thing will ever listen to is if they're going to lose power. And if they know that enough of the electorate won't put up with it, well, that will make them change course. So you have to have a public uh, that isn't going to tolerate that sort of thing anymore. Uh, but tying into what we said earlier on on the economic side, um, if the government didn't have these vast revenue streams coming in, uh, it wouldn't be able to do all of these things. Uh, it would have to focus its money on the things that really matter, keeping our roads in order, keeping the police, keeping the courts going, uh, running a basic education system, uh, and they wouldn't have time to fund all of this meddling, uh, funding people that spend their whole time thinking up ways to teach their worldview to your children. So the economic side of it is actually very important, as well as the public education side of it. Uh, and it'd also be good not to write local governments a, a blank check so they can make decisions like abolishing Australia Day. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, and, and this is that issue there is so typical of 
uh, left-wing overreach. They they constantly overstep and show people where they're really heading and what they're really thinking and what they're really doing. Uh, if they if they were smart at this, you know, with everything going on in Australia at the moment, they'd say right. Um, that issue, we'll just we'll just hold back on that one. We'll just leave that one. We'll try and get the ones we really think are important over, and then once that's all in, settled, and bedded down, then we'll start pushing our next piece of nonsense. But they can't do that. They just simply can't help themselves. Every single time they get an opportunity to undermine the culture of Australia, they'll take it. And as soon as they think they've got the numbers in any sort of government area, and it's often local government, uh, they will make a move to try and cause trouble. Uh, that's all we've got uh, time for. Uh, I've really enjoyed our chat, so thank you, Stephen, for coming on the show today. No problem. Any time. It's a pleasure. Thanks for the time. And hopefully, we'll see we'll see some victories in the in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. So please, if you haven't already, sign up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Please consider supporting the work of The Unshackled. You can become a patron on Patreon. We also have Unshackled merchandise uh, for sale at uprightmarket.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And, of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.